Well, I'd just, I'd just gone to bed pretty much. It was about, well, one, in the, one o'clock in the morning, just gone to sleep. Then when the pager went off, I turned it off quickly so I didn't wake my wife and daughter up. Jumped out of bed, didn't even have time to get my pyjamas off. I wasn't that surprised when the pager went off. I had noticed the weather before I went to bed and it, it was one weather that we'd get a shout in. A day earlier, Paul Harrison and his son Sean set off on a passage from North Shields to the Isle of Man via Peterhead aboard their motorboat Princess. We'd set sail from uh, North Shields. Um, we got out into the North Sea and we were about five miles off the coast heading up towards uh, Scotland. Um, the sea conditions were perfect. Yeah, it's really sunny and really nice, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. We were doing everything by the book, you know, there was nothing that we weren't doing. Then the weather started to change. The wind picked up, the waves grew, and Paul noticed a worrying problem. The steering started to feel a bit funny, it's hydraulic steering. One minute it was, we had pressure, and the next minute it just gone, it was like there was nothing there at all. Unfortunately, the current, the the tide that was coming in was far faster than what the power in the engines on the, the boat were. Um, we just ended up getting forced back. Yeah. And then with the steering the way it was, there was nothing we could do. The next minute we knew we were up and then bang right down onto the top of the rocks. Grounded with waves breaking over their boat, Paul and Sean alerted the Coast Guard and sheltered in the cabin. Within minutes, the Anne Struther inshore lifeboat was ready, with volunteers Barry Gourley, Ewan Hogan and Becky Jewell as crew. Barry was at the helm and knew that he faced tough conditions. You heard the waves, we didn't see them through the night, it was just black. You couldn't see a thing, no moon, stars, anything. I hit the waves. I slowed the boat down, I just went to the two and looked, we're just going to have to hud on and go for it. There's two people on this boat and it's breaking up and they're like, OK, let's go then. Back aboard the Princess, Paul and Sean were taking a battering. But when the floor came up, and you've got two big six-cylinder uh, Gardner engines, and they're underneath and they're getting lifted up, yeah. that's some power yeah. then. There was a lot of water coming in at that point. Oh there? yeah, because the, the stern was full then. You know, the, you could see the stern, the, the cooker had come out, actually come out, the fridge, fridge had come out, the fridge was floating. <laughs> Time was running out. They were in danger of being trapped in the cabin as the floor was pushed upwards. Meanwhile, the lifeboat crew had a problem of their own. Right along the coast here's nothing but tree lines. And we couldn't see them. Because Becky and you and they usually sit at the front and let me know when there's one coming up. But they couldn't see a thing, you know, and we saw them and we're passing them. When that happened, I thought, oh God, here we go. <laughs> we're in for it tonight. Barry untangled the propeller and set off again towards the princess. By now, Paul and Sean had decided it was too dangerous to stay aboard. They were ready to abandon ship. We'd have gone. We were going because we were on the outer rail. We decided then that because the time, the amount of time, the condition of the boat, we just thought, like, well, we'll make a go for it. It was at that moment that the lifeboat crew arrived on scene. They saw the lights of the princess and two figures ready to jump. When we'd realised that they were about to jump, or we just thought we were going to have to go in, otherwise they are going to end up in the water, do some serious damage to ourselves, maybe they wouldn't make it. No time to wait, so I just shouted to the two of them, look, hold on, we're going in. Went in and picked a wave, went in the back of a wave, and uh, turned, and I got most of the way around, and another breaker come in, and I'd, a couple of seconds later, it would have been a different story, but then, because I was round that wee bit, it then spun us round, helping us. We had breaking waves coming in, and we didn't know the depth at all. Um, we were just kind of expecting the engine to cut out at any moment, so we had to really shout that they would have to come forward to us. Um, but they did, but we, we managed to get them to do that, and that was a relief. Once you're on that rib... It's like a massive relief, it's isn't it? Just relief, it? yeah. It's just relief, yeah. It's just, you know... what. You know, you, you just know that you're OK, you're safe. Shocked and shivering, Paul and Sean huddled together 
as Barry headed towards the Anstruther all-weather lifeboat. So we had, it seemed ages, but I reckon it was only a couple of minutes and the LB was alongside us, we transferred them over and uh, even that was a bit hairy, got them on though. I mean, you, could, you didn't realise the size of waves going along, so you couldn't see them. But when you saw them coming back, it was a place. Like, that was quite bad for the night. With the casualties safe, both lifeboats headed to station. Coming back, I had time to think what could have went wrong. Like, all I could have taken was the propeller to clip a rock. I could have turned it wrong well, a couple of seconds later, could have been over. What could have happened to the two in front of me? And, uh, but luckily, we were all right. When we got back to the RNLI station, I said, uh, who was it who was in the river? I said, because he couldn't have a brain. <laughs> There's no way he could have a brain. To do what he did with that rib in, that, in them conditions, you know, that takes something. Paul and Sean were checked over, given dry clothes, food and tea. One crew member even gave them a bed for the night. They were just fantastic. There was nothing that they didn't do for us. Um, a lot of people don't realise that they're, they're not paid for it no. and they have jobs to do as well. You know, when they're putting their lives in jeopardy for, to save other people's lives. Then the next morning when we actually saw we went down, the, the, tide was the rocks, out. when the tide was out, it was like that. We'd have been cut to bits. We wouldn't have survived if we'd have gone in. Yeah, for swimming that would have been too many rocks out there and the conditions would have been too difficult. I don't think we'd have made it swimming ashore. It's not until you get back home after you, the shock and the, you, the adrenaline's worn off and you look like your, your family and you've made it back. That's when it hits you that you, you know, you're very lucky to be alive. 